All right, I think we can get started. Um, thank you guys so much for joining. Happy Monday. Hope everyone had a wonderful weekend. Um, I think so excited to be here with you today. Um, just a couple housekeeping things. Um, first of all, thank you. Second of all, um, as we go through the presentation, we'll be going through five different sections. Um, I'll pause at the end of each section and our team will be looking at questions that come up. So we'll be able to address those at the end of each section. Ask away, I'm really excited to talk about fashion and beauty and how this current pandemic is affecting those industries. Um, so I think we can go ahead and get started. I think um, it's no secret that what's happening right now is an acceleration of trends across the board. If you think about on-demand grocery, if you think about at-home fitness, um, there are certain behaviors that we're establishing right now, certain habits that we expect will turn years of disruption into weeks and months. And I think the fashion and beauty industry is no different there. Um, we're already seeing because of the discretionary nature of fashion and beauty spend, um, different subsegments of the industry are hit in different ways. Um, but across the board, we're seeing year over year declines in beauty, in apparel, in footwear, in accessories. Um, and I think there's this kind of perfect storm that's happening right now on the supply chain, on the demand, or sorry, on the supply side on the demand side. I think if you think about factories shutting down in China and Italy, major production centers like that, um, leading to canceled orders. And then on the demand side, we're having less and less discretionary income with job loss, um, plus decreases in forward looking consumer confidence. It's kind of this perfect blend of crises on both sides of that equation that are um, setting the industry up for some challenges going ahead. I think if we look back to the 2008-2009 recession, we did see a contraction in luxury um, across the board during that recession. And I think what happened was there were a couple different levers that back then uh, the fashion and beauty industry used to dig itself out of that hole. Um, one of the levers that they that the industry pulled was on the price side. And so if you think about um, an item like the Hermes Kelly bag, there was a 58% increase in the price of that Kelly bag. Um, it was growing 1.5 times faster than inflation. Um, and so I think the industry looked to increasing price um, via willingness to pay um, as a way to dig itself out of the recession. The other was on the quantity side. So I think about, or if you think about the different sectors with which the industry looked to for growth. I think following the 2008 recession, China accounted for um, China accounted for nearly half of all luxury growth from about 2012 to 2018. And I think if you think about if you, so, I think it's helpful to look to the past and say, OK, there might be some lessons that we can take away. Um, but what's happening in this time in fashion and beauty is China is still big, um, but might not have the same upside. I think consumers are we're seeing the behavior to trade down in price right now. And so I think we'll, we're looking ahead to see what are the levers that the industry will pull this go round. Um, you know, if the, the, the crisis might hit different income, income segments differently, and so we're looking ahead to see how the industry will dig itself out of this current crisis. Um, we do know that markets do come back. Um, the luxury goods market, even though it did contract, will is expected to return to positive growth um, over the next couple years. And I think if you look at how um, prior crises have hit the industry, it takes about six months to two years to get back. We do expect a, we do expect demand to return and the industry to grow. But I think the good news is we're starting to see um, positive changes that are being accelerated within the industry that frankly the industry has been begging for for a while. Um, I think it's it's definitely certain that some brands may not survive the crisis. I think this crisis will 
amplify the challenges that already weak businesses were facing, um, but it might bring along some positive changes that um, we've been begging for in the industry, which we'll get to in a bit. I will pause there. Are there any questions in the chat? All right. No, no questions so far. OK, great. So diving into our first trend, I think what we've seen in uh, in uh, shopping, both on the physical retail side and on the e-commerce side, um, we've seen kind of the, the rise of e-commerce in service of physical retail. And I think what this pandemic is starting to accelerate is a shift of that on its head, where it's no longer that e-commerce needs to work in service of physical retail. We're starting to see that equation shift. And I think a lot of this has to do with um, yes, we know physical retail is closing, but the amount of debt that's been taken on in the past decade for physical retail um, is pretty tremendous. And I think we're seeing that magnified right now. Uh, over 190,000 stores are closing, but I think if you look at debt positions, 30% of companies uh, were in trouble with debt before this crisis hit. The longer that physical stores remain closed, the harder it will be for stores that rely on physical retail for growth and for revenue. Um, those businesses will have a harder time as we enter the recovery phase, depending on how long we're in this um, situation. And I think when we do return to shopping, which we will, um, I think we're gonna see a, a new normal of shopping in physical spaces. I think for one, um, we've already seen in essential businesses, cleanliness measures like um, spraying down surfaces, things like that will become the norm. I think when you think about um, the thought of having to pull out a credit card after this pandemic is kind of a far away thought. We, I, we do expect to see an increase in contactless payment, even things like self-checkout. And I think when you think about self-checkout within a luxury context, I don't think it'll look like these Amazon turnstiles. But I think the idea of me as a customer walking into a store, being able to be identified as a loyal customer and being able to walk out in a really seamless, non-distracting way, I think will become the norm in physical retail. We're also seeing stores, um, as I mentioned, kind of stores work in service of e-commerce in a lot of ways and be flexible across channels. I think the physical footprint will start to um, change its meaning and in function. Uh, we expect to see things like click and collect, where, for example, where physical retail serves as a distribution center um, to account for uh, nearly $88 billion in sales in the next couple years. We're seeing COVID-19 already accelerate this trend with in the restaurant business as well and other essential businesses. We, ex we expect this to be um, a, a function and a feature of most physical retail going forward. And I think along those same lines, um, physical retail working as distribution centers to service last mile delivery, like Target does with their same day pickup and delivery options and using their local store formats as warehouse and distribution centers. I think we'll see um, physical retail again, take on new functions uh, that work in service of a more digital model. Now that said, I think what we're seeing in this time is that businesses with um, a, a solid digital footprint and knowledge of e-commerce and what e-commerce means to the brand are succeeding. I think we're it's no secret that e-commerce is taking off. That's obvious because it's kind of the only way we can shop. But if you think about a brand like Nike, where they have a unique customer ID that they use to connect across consumer touch points, whether that's physical retail, whether that's e-commerce, whether that's Nike Training Center or other apps within their ecosystem. I think brands that are able to link identity across physical and digital formats are poised to win, and that will be the norm as we come out of this crisis. Um, the rise in e-commerce is forcing brands that weren't even online, did not sell online at all, like Patek Philippe, um, to come online. They're doing e-commerce for the first time with select retail partners. Um, there are brands like Chanel that are still resisting e-commerce, but I think, um, especially at the higher end of the luxury sector, 
Um, I think there's been this movement, this very, very slow movement towards coming online and doing e-commerce. Obviously, that has um, the brand risk there for the luxury brands like Patek Philippe or Chanel is big in their minds. But I think they're seeing that if all stores close, um, they kind of have no room to turn. I think Chanel is a bit different because um, most of their, a lot of the revenue is made up from makeup and sunglasses and things like that. But and um, it's forcing luxury brands, especially at the high end, to reevaluate what e-commerce means to them and how they can play in that ecosystem. But I think for years, we've really been looking towards things like 3D imaging or at-home try-on, um, tactics that can bring a physical store experience to online. I think now is really the, the time for this type of tech to shine. Um, we're seeing an app called Hero uh, in a lot of the fashion and beauty PR right now. Hero is an app. Um, they've worked with a number of brands like Credo, like Levi's, like Nike, um, that are taking, the app is a messaging and virtual customer service tool that can enable things like video chatting, for example. Um, they are working with a brand called Anushka uh, to embed messaging and one-to-one -one styling in the in the Anushka.com uh, experience. And I think what's also nice about this is as wholesale and as own brand physical retail closed, they were able to take their physical retail staff and repurpose them into e-commerce sales associates. And I expect more of this digital interaction on site um, as you would with a beauty advisor at a Saks Fifth Avenue, for example, um, to be more of an embedded process in the e-commerce journey. Keels is doing is taking a similar tack here with um, chatbots on their site. I think this will become table stakes for any e-commerce experience. They are rumored to be launching as well virtual uh, skincare consultations. We haven't seen that yet in market, but that's the kind of interaction and personalized service that we're seeing from e-commerce. I think what's nice about this Keels example too is. They've been working for years to build out this healthy skin hub. A lot of that content is being ported into the chatbot experience and the virtual consultation experience. Um, and I think it's it's a really nice way to bring that in-store experience to digital as well. Um, Dior's kind of done this a bit more on the nose with a 3D recreation on their .com. Um, of their beauty store in Paris. And so the way that the experience works is you go on to virtualstore.dior.com slash champs Elysees, and you can, it's a 3D image that you can uh, walk into the store. You can explore products. For example, you can explore their perfumes by touching the black buttons on the bottom of each of them. You can walk around the store. You can try and ask questions. Um, I think we'll see more of this type of experimentation. I think uh, this is almost a stepping stone towards a superlative e-commerce experience. I think e-commerce doesn't necessarily need to be a store like a physical store, but I do think elements of this where you're getting to see the product alongside decorations like flowers and in the context of the broader product set, I think is, um, a nice way that Dior is bringing that store experience to life. Um, we're seeing a lot more social commerce as well. Um, McKinsey said that uh, almost a quarter of US and European consumers expect to increase their spend via social channels in April 2020. And I think brands are using this as an opportunity not just to put shoppable tags on their Instagram, um, on their Instagram posts, but experiment in new channels um, that might be lower cost because not many advertising or act not many advertisers are activating in those spaces right now and experimenting. Um, I think one brand that is and is doing an awesome job is Levi's. Um, they are using they're taking this pandemic as an opportunity to experiment on TikTok. Um, they've just uh, a, a couple weeks ago launched shoppable uh, shoppable TikTok videos where they highlighted their future perfect laser technology um, where you could customize a pair of jeans on TikTok, shop the experience, 
Um, and I thought it was a really nice way to bring that younger generation into the fold and test into a channel that um, may have been maybe either cost prohibitive or less of a priority um, in the pre-pandemic. But now with the rise of social commerce, I think is an even bigger part of that digital commerce experience. Um, but I think as we move forward, we mentioned um, like Nike taking that unique customer ID and using that to uh, have all channels work well together, deliver that truly omni-channel experience. Um, and I think what happens when physical retail and digital retail work in tandem and that physical retail works to support digital commerce in a lot of ways, I think what we can start to see is even more um, personalized, fully bespoke shopping experiences with CRM tools that can manage that ongoing dialogue across physical and digital touch points and that knows who I am, knows what I buy, knows how I want to interact and can deliver that at scale across touch points from a brand. So I'll pause there before going into the next section. Any questions in the chat? Still good to go. Okay, great. So I think as we think about this shift towards digital and the rebalance more towards digital, I think we're starting to see brands experimenting with new ways to connect with consumers, not just through e-commerce, but across digital channels. Um, it can be as simple as using content to either connect or provide education or community. This Glossier example on the left, I think is it's kind of, it's, it's a little tr silly, but I think it illustrates a really strong point. So Glossier has been um, really excelling during the pandemic with entertaining their, their customer base. They posted this video of a goat eating a chair. I mean, it's super silly, um, but then they asked, their, they asked their fans, what do you wanna see? Do you want beauty tips? Do you want to buy products and, um, you know, engage in some shopping therapy? Do you want jokes? Do you want memes? How can we make your day a bit better? And I think this goes a long way because I think it illustrates the point of there are channels that are not .com that brands can use to engage consumers. And it's as simple as asking, right? It's as simple as asking, getting feedback, and then acting on that feedback um, that I think is really powerful and a tool that, yes, is crucial during uh, the response phase, but as crucial during the recovery phase, that direct communication. Um, brands that are notoriously shut off from other channels as well are starting to get involved with more um, engagement and robust content around their brands. So The Row, who was founded by Mary-Kate and Ashley Olson, who are notoriously off-press, don't do interviews, they're starting to launch more and more content, music, playlists, so you can get a sneak peek behind the brand. And I think it's a really nice way to provide access where you might not be buying the clothes, but you're still getting a taste of the brand. And it's much more about awareness than it is about conversion, but I think it's, it's a good time to be doing those types of things right now, while it could come across as a bit tone deaf to sell me a $1,200 pair of shoes, for example. Um, and with fashion shows canceled, I think we're starting to see new ways that brands are holding their fashion shows online. I think it's nothing new to um, have a digital fashion show. We know Fenty has been experimenting with um, Amazon for a while um, in creating digital fashion shows. But um, the first Shanghai was the first fashion week to go fully digital, and they did they did it with. Um, Alibaba's Tmall. It was largely see now, buy now. Um, they leveraged influencers, which we'll get into a bit, where they were styling the clothes their own way. Um, I think we're looking ahead to see what happens to fashion shows when this is all done. Sometimes it feels like, you know, for eight shows a year across the globe, not only is that um, a huge carbon emissions uh, challenge, um, but also with a number of new digital tools, which we'll get into, the purpose of a fashion show is shifting maybe from um, merchandising with department stores to more of a consumer 
direct play. Um, we're seeing a ton more live streaming um, and it's proving pretty effective. Uh, during Paris Fashion Week in February, the showroom agency DFO hit 80% of their sales targets. So digital fashion shows, I think, are a promising way um, to hit sales numbers and um, get clothes out there to the masses and to buyers that need them. Um, speaking of influencers, I think we're seeing we're, there's a bit of backlash to influencers. I think early in the crisis with Ariel Charnas from Something Navy um, having some complications around getting testing and what that meant for testing equity and things like that. But the fact of the matter is influencers are really one of the only ways to do branded content right now. And we're seeing a ton more engagement with influencers right now. Um, we're seeing them repurposed in new ways. So this Louis Vuitton um, example is the, there because Shanghai Fashion Week was um, only digital this year. Uh, Louis Vuitton worked with a number of Chinese uh, influencers to share their show experiences from current and past, wear the clothes, style the bags. Um, and I think they, Louis Vuitton, I think is a leader in kind of this fully functioning omni-channel platform even before the virus began. And I think inserting influencers in the place of the show, they've said that they've recorded record numbers of um, engagements on Tmall, on WeChat, around the show and around the products released. Um, so again, I think a really effective way um, to use influencers right now as well. And then I think if we think a little bit further out, the ultimate digital connection in fashion, which could solve a number of sustainability challenges um, and other kind of production challenges, which we'll get to, are digital clothes. I think when we're seeing consumers now at home, gaming and esports are on the rise. A digital identity is a big part of those um, experiences. So wearing digital clothes in game, things like that, investing in your digital identity and persona, um, I think will translate outside of gaming and esports. Um, we're already starting to see this with brands like Carlings launching digital only um, fashion collections where for about $50, you can get a Carlings digital designer to fit a look exactly to your body for your Instagram pictures, for example, um, is both an economical, environmentally responsible, I think a bit further out. But we're starting to see seeds of that behavior accelerating through uh, coronavirus. So before we get to wholesale, any questions? Still good to go. Okay. Excellent. So just as I think physical retail and digital retail are ongoing or, or undergoing a reset, um, we're seeing the same thing with wholesale. And I think for a long time, um, especially since the 2008 recession, I think wholesale has been caught in this discounting inventory, uh, heavy rotation of styles through the store that's unsustainable for brands. Um, and I think we're seeing the, the balance flip as well um, and brands kind of taking back some power from wholesale. Uh, going forward. I think, you know, you'll read a lot about the death of wholesale things like Neiman Marcus is filing for bankruptcy uh, this, <laughs> this week reportedly. Um, I think Moda Operandi is permanently closing their men's line. Um, and I think it's reflective really of decades of this discount culture permeating the industry. Um, wholesale was pretty broken before this. And I think what coronavirus is doing is accelerating this demise um, and sifting out winners from losers uh, and driving innovation in the wholesale category. I think for the most part, wholesale has been unprofitable. They've been failing to disrupt themselves. I think what we're seeing since the coronavirus hit is first, uh, a lot of merchandise that's coming into the wholesale retail right now arrives and is immediately discounted. And so what we're looking at, the data that we're looking at here is 
the percent of assortment that has arrived in wholesale retailers that is discounted. So if you compare the orange line, which is 2020, to the blue line, which is 2019, we're already seeing 60% of the assortment in the middle of March um, discounted in stores, which is pretty astronomical when you look at 2019, where that's around 15% less. I think compounding that is um, a lot of retailers are canceling their orders. Um, first in spring, of course, because they knew stores would be closed. Um, but I think a lot of wholesale retailers are starting to consider or even already cancel um, pre-fall, fall seasons. Um, so, and I think this is reflective that they're expecting week sales until at least September or October. And so what we're looking at here is uh, in 2019, at the end of March, new arrivals looked at, or was around 100,000 of new styles entering the market. In that same period, it's down to about 50,000. So what's happening is brands have already engaged in the production and manufacturing of, this, of these clothes. The wholesale retailers aren't taking them. And so what's happening is this massive buildup of inventory on the brand side um, that brands frankly need to figure out what to do with. Um, this is an illustration that shows kind of what tactics are available to different brands. I think um, some will be already sold, some will be discounted, some will be upcycled or potentially saved for later, um, but brands are starting to run out of space to hold all of this inventory. Um, and we're, we, the industry does have certain um, outlets in place um, to handle this. Something like the Outnet, for example, that sells, it's almost, I don't want to call it a TJ Maxx of e-commerce, but um, in a lot, of, it's, it's an outlet for uh, inventory that would otherwise not be sold through wholesale retailer. I think, um, you know, even as we're skipping seasons, this excess stock we could see go to a place like the Outnet, like Ukes. I think we'll see new business models um, spin up around around those types of um, discount wholesale models, outlet models. Um, we're starting to see secondhand and rental play a role in this as well. I think brands like The Real Real and Rent the Runway, we're already seeing brands send their canceled inventory that's already manufactured to those places. Ghani is, for example, one of those that sent inventory to the real real. And I think if you think back to 2008 um, and the excess inventory problem that occurred then as the result of wholesale canceling, it, it, uh, it caused new brands like Gilt, for example, to be born out of that crisis. We expect a similar mechanism here. If the outnet, if um, you can't sell all of that excess inventory, we'll start to see more experimentation around business models that um, can meet that. So I think we're, the, the obvious answer to um, wholesale potentially reducing in scale, reducing in leverage, I think the corollary effect of that is we expect many brands to invest much more in their direct to consumer business. I think when you see brands like Levi's who um, they have around 15% of their sales are direct. Um, Nike has a similar ratio of their direct sales. I think we'll see brands, power brands like those, lead the market in this shift towards direct. I think wholesale will play a role, but I think wholesale might look different to brands, especially as this leverage, uh, especially as this leverage transfers. Um, but I think wholesale does still play a role. I think we'll see more things like um, Glossier's pop in in Nordstrom, where it's more of a concession model, where the brand takes out a bespoke box within a wholesaler. It almost looks like a mall within a store. Um, those brands tend to be immune to wholesale's uh, seasonal discounting. Um, but I think this is one way that we'll see wholesale work for brands, but I think it does depend on the brand being a power brand, for example. Um, I, I, but I think on the whole, we will see power shift towards brands. I think as more and more wholesale retailers um, go out of business, declare bankruptcy, get taken private, 
the number will shrink, their leverage will shrink, and that power will be, that power will be transferred over to brands, I think, of all sizes. Um, we're already starting to see brands, especially small designers, be really choosy about the wholesalers they do work with, um, working with the ones that give them favorable terms um, or, you know, other more brand friendly uh, tactics. Um, but I do think we'll see this translate mostly in more and more investment in direct channels. And I think after this, after the crisis enters into its recovery mode, I do think we'll see a shakeout in terms of uh, which brands had direct sales in place before this and were able to survive and which were loaded up on debt and have reliant on wholesale um, agreements for sales. Um, they might not do as well as we enter recovery. Adam, before we move on to the next, are there any questions in the chat? Nope, good to go. All right. Um, so I think as we look at shifts in the industry um, from physical to digital and then from wholesale to direct, I think this all adds up to flexible, cha supply chains need to get much more flexible to be able to support this rise and fall in demand and in taste. Um, we're seeing this crisis already impact supply chains and um, providers uh, pretty hard already. Um, Li and Fung is a, um, they're one of the major, um, they're one of the major production facilities and partners that brands use. Um, they've already had to go private as the result of all of these canceled orders. Um, Cytex, that's another um, manufacturing provider, is already working at a 25% reduced capacity that's expected to go down to 50%. Um, this crisis is having the the crisis of wholesale canceled orders, excess inventory is having an impact and setting off this chain reaction downstream to every partner that a fashion brand or re retailer works with. Um, vertical integration would be the best case scenario for brands um, that takes you know a decade to implement, but we are seeing companies like Hermes, Chanel, Gucci, Louis Vuitton that own their own factories in Italy and France, um, more easily able to start and stop production um, and participate in more of this reactive manufacturing. I do think that vertical integration is not uh, and financially the right um, answer for brands, especially on the smaller end. Um, it's also time consuming, so it might not be more of this response tactic that we could see, but we are seeing that supply chains will get much more flexible. There might be more and more of an emphasis on made in America, um, but with many of these apparel, fashion, beauty companies looking towards onshoring, nearshoring, um, to be able to embed that flexibility in their supply chain and diversify, especially away from manufacturing in just China or just Italy, for example, as a way to hedge risk. Um, but even as we look to wholesale, brands now have tools to get smarter about this production and digitize the process anyway. Um, there are platforms like Jure, for example, that are digital wholesale buying um, platforms that can connect retailers to brands. Um, so you almost don't even need a fashion show anymore in a lot of ways. Um, and you can do that. It, it reframes the importance of connections with buyers and what the role of the show is, what the role of market visits are, for example, um, if you can see entire collections online via photos and videos. I think we'll also see more and more unbundling of uh, production. Um, partners like Flexport, for example, um, can are helping to unbundle that production and offset production from the brand to the platform. Um, companies like Angora Group are also, I think, on the rise here where they can actually manufacture samples, introduce you to the right production partners, get that manufacturing kickstarted um, so that the brand can focus on the idea and the creation and doesn't have to worry as much about the back end. And I think all of these things are working to 
make supply chains even more flexible, even more just in time, um, and be able to respond to um, behavioral shifts, trends going forward as we enter recovery, even more real time. Um, like I said, this is kick the supply chain crisis. Yes, impacts brands, and I think you know that's terrible. Um, I think there are we are starting to see the seeds of humanitarian crisis in company or in countries like Bangladesh, where um, two million plus workers are working in garment manufacturing. They might not be at the level of artisan production as in India or Brazil, for example. Um, but it is having a very large impact to the tune of $2.9 billion of exports um, being canceled that has a real impact on countries that might not be able or might not have the resources um, to recover in the same way that more industrialized countries are. And I think we're seeing brands step in and uh, play a role here, which I think is going a long way as well. Um, both H&M and Zara committed to paying their suppliers for canceled orders. I think we're seeing that um, on the high end as well. Um, Everlane announced that they would also, they've been in a bit of turmoil in this whole crisis, but um, committing to their production partners to fulfill those orders. Um, I think these are going far farther than most others in the industry, um, but I think go a long way in terms of brand building and awareness and trust. Um, on the flip side of that, I think what this crisis is showing is uh, it's bringing to light all of the excesses that we have in the fashion industry. And this could bring along some positive changes towards fewer, better, longer lasting clothes um, that I think we've, we've been talking about for a while that we haven't seen happen in a material way. That could look like alternative fabrics. That could look like onshoring or nearshoring to reduce carbon footprint. But I think it's accelerating this move that we've seen from shareholder to stakeholder capitalism. You saw, um, I'm sure you've seen Jamie Dimon, other CEOs signing um, a letter from the Business Roundtable to reorient profit around purpose and stakeholders. Um, and I think this is kind of a, a silver lining and a, a nice byproduct of what's happening is if this crisis can drive a move towards reducing the 114 billion uh, garments we produce every year. I think that's a positive step for the industry. Um, more specifically, I think if we look back to the 2008 crisis, brands that did meet standards for um, social environmental performance outperformed. Um, they outperformed those that didn't have those values embedded into their business model, not just marketing. Um, B Corps are better prepared to weather these crises. So it's not just a marketing tactic, it's better business to um, embed societal good and, um, and the envir environmentally positive practices into business models. Um, and I think that could be another positive impact of uh, coming out of this crisis as we enter recovery. Any questions? Yep, we do have one. Um, do you see the changes in supply chains, more flexibility in local, also leading to greater flexibility and in innovation away from a, from a single global standard model, from the single global standard model we are used to, leading to new store brands, but also challenges of globalization with managing different standards, et cetera? I think that's a good question. I do think that the more the more control you can have over supply chain and the more responsive you can be to consumer taste, the more you can innovate, I think, in media, if that's what the question is, um, if that's what the question is getting at. I think um, if you, so say you're running a campaign and you wanna sell through AR, for example, you don't have the sales model and you don't have the production that can support whatever you're selling through a limited edition AR drop, for example. Um, I think if you can't if you can't uh, fulfill that order, you kind of can't innovate in that way on the front end with media. And so I think the two work really nicely in tandem where 
if I want to experiment with new sales models or I want to experiment with new types of fabrics and I want to do a more iterative test and learn model, um, I do think you need to be able to start and stop on the back end more easily. And I think it's that melding of the front end and back end that'll be kind of a, a virtuous cycle of reinforcing each other and getting better and better and iterating more and more. A couple more questions just came in. Uh, the first one, yeah. how is the pop in different than a beauty counter? Yeah, so the pop in the pop in is more prevalent in um, the pop in is more prevalent in fashion. We did see Glossier, for example, um, work with Nordstrom to launch their fragrance called Glossier U, um, Y O U. Uh, they didn't have a beauty counter in the store. I think the difference with pop ins is that it's um, less time. It's more flexible. Beauty counters are still um, susceptible to the discounting that wholesale has, but we, um, I think it's more of a, it, I wouldn't call it an experimental format. I would call it a, um, it, there are just more flexible terms for a brand. Um, and I think you only get that leverage if you have a super strong brand like a Glossier, for example, that was launching one product. Um, I think that the, the other way to read into that is, um, Glossier decides to do a pop in and not a permanent beauty counter because they have the leverage and they have a strong direct business and don't need to rely on wholesale for distribution. Whereas I think if you look at some of the beauty counter, I think brands, and this is a general statement, um, are more reliant on wholesale for distribution than they are on their own channels. And so I think it's a trade off. And I think deciding whether to have a permanent space in wholesale retail or have a pop in, I think just depends on what the objective is for the brand. Um, so, but I, I do think um, the more concession based models will be more and more prevalent going forward. One more question. Uh, as this power transfers from large established retailers, what will be the impact on historically powerful brands within those environments? Yeah, I think uh, I think all brands are trying to um, invest in direct right now, even the Louis Vuittons and the Gucci's of the world. What I almost see, or what I can almost see happening, is wholesale acts as um, you could almost see a strategy shaking out, like brands who are doing really well on Amazon are doing. So for example, the way that Kiehl's works with Amazon is they put their kind of entry level creamy eye avocado treatment and some of their other more basic cleansers on Amazon and use it as a doorway into their broader portfolio for their more advanced serums, advanced face masks. And so I could almost see um, a larger brand looking at wholesale, not as I need to sell my entire collection, but being really choosy about putting the merchandise into wholesale that resonates with that audience and might sp might spur an interest in the brand um, that could then lead to like a longer lifetime value for the customer as they go to Louis Vuitton.com, for example. Um, but I think um, I lost my train of thought, but I think that large brands probably stand to benefit more from that. I think if you think about, well, Barney's no longer exists, but the the secret sauce of Barney's was a platform for small designers and they almost needed small designers um, for their cachet and their cultural relevance. And I actually think the balance of power might flip also where um, if I'm a surviving Nordstrom, for example, Nordstrom is a good example of this, I might not need Gucci or Louis Vuitton or Dior in Nordstrom. If I'm Nordstrom, I might need the smaller brands now to stay relevant and stay cool and stay differentiated. So I almost think it has more of an impact on the on the emerging designer side than it probably does on the larger brand side. All right. So I've alluded to this a couple times, but I think within fashion and beauty, I think designers, brands, even retailers have kind of been begging for this all to slow down. If you think about um, the amount of shows that brands 
brands need to design for now. Um, there were, you know, there's spring, there's pre-fall, there's resort, there's fall, there's, you know, all of these eight different eight different seasons that a designer has to design a collection for leaves no room for creativity. And so I think the first sign of this is that shows are being canceled. Uh, Men's Fashion Week in Paris is canceled. Um, Resort is canceled in Paris. Paris Couture is canceled. Milan's, Milan's Men's Fashion Week will now be combined with women's in September, if that even happens. The British Fashion Council is working on virtual versions of their shows in June. Um, I think it's almost forcing a slowdown in the show calendar. And I think a lot of editors are really happy um, that this is happening because they don't have to fly around the globe um, for the foreseeable future. I think what's also happening is yes, shows are being canceled, but we're also seeing an impact in more of the middle contemporary tiers. So um, H&M sales are down. They took out a loan for liquidity. Zara is writing off inventory. Um, fast retailing, fast retailing is cutting their annual profit guidance. I think w the fast fashion industry has long been um, questioned for ethical practices around making too many garments, um, and we might see a slowdown in um, that type of kind of always on clothing manufacturing that we're seeing from these brands. Um, but I think the cri this crisis might push the industry to correct what um, the industry has frankly been complaining about um, for quite some time now and what's become unimaginable. I think when you look at Vogue Italia, they came out with this iconic cover um, in April that was all white. And what, they, what the editor in chief was saying and talking about was, this all white cover serves or signifies kind of a rebirth in the industry, light after darkness, but also white space to create a new system from scratch um, and be more in line with what consumers want and what's good for the planet. Um, I think we'll see a wholesale slowdown of fashion. Giorgio Armani has been talking a lot in the crisis about a slowdown being the only way out. And I think if you look back to pre-coronavirus, it was nonstop shows, merchandise, deliveries, drops, media, one season kind of rolling into the next where designers didn't have time to go to Morocco and get inspiration and build that inspiration into their collection. It was more just responding and iterating and always on. And frankly, it was spectacles for spectacle's sake and kind of unimaginable. It all started with um, a lot of people think it started with this Fendi show that was on the Great Wall of China, where it was almost the first, um, the first taste back, you know, eight years ago, where fashion wasn't about the clothes, it was about the spectacle. And I think ever since then, we've kind of been on this hamster wheel and not able to get ourselves out. Um, Burberry. Uh, was kind of the anti-example of this kind of spectacle for spectacle's sake. Um, a couple years ago, they moved towards making their fashion shows only twice a year, um, all direct to consumer. They, they offered only um, buy now, wear now. So meaning what they showed on the runway was actually what showed up in stores. Um, it, it kind of um, retooled the way that buyers would go in and buy the merchandise in after shows and then load that into their stores um, a couple months after that. Um, but many designers say um, they're in this crisis right now where the stuff they're producing now might get pushed back um, a couple seasons this year. Um, and I think it may, what's happening right now may reset this paradigm of walking into a wholesaler in April and seeing winter coats, I think we might see more of a realignment around um, this see now buy now concept where when a brand makes a spring jacket, it gets in stores in spring and not in the fall, for example. And I think this merchandise reset is going to be good for the industry. But I think if you think about kind of why we buy clothes and kind of the psychology behind this, um, we buy things when we have somewhere to go. Um, and I think what this whole crisis has questioned is 
what happens when we have nowhere to go? I think, yes, we're all buying sweatpants and athleisure in the short term, but does that stay after this? I think we're starting to see fashion insiders kind of think about what that looks like. Um, ultimately, we really dress to tell stories about ourselves. And I think is loungewear the image that you want to be putting out there to the world? Um, I think, you know, you can easily associate loungewear sweatpants with losing yourself or maybe lacking a sense of um, a sense of focus. It's totally fine right now. I'm talking about when we enter recovery, but I think what we're seeing is this nascent consumer behavior and desire to break out of that and stand for something and say something with our clothes that um, might have a longer term movement away from athleisure uh, that we've seen kind of take over the fashion industry um, in the last couple years. So I think if we look ahead, I think there will be a bigger emphasis on not clothes that are attached to trends, but on things that are timeless and seasonless that can't be discounted because you can always buy them. Um, this is a lesson we also learned from 2008. And I think we're really realizing as we're, you know, sitting in our homes that we might not need as much as we previously thought we did now that everything is really unavailable to us. Um, in addition to, of course, being squeezed by the recession, but I think we'll see this move towards fewer, better things um, and potentially away from cheaper labor and materials, um, but more towards this idea of forever pieces and war capsule wardrobes and things that might, um, not put as much strain on the entire fashion industry and supply chain going forward. And so I think with that, there are a couple um, there are a couple lessons I think that we can take from this current response phase that I think will set the next normal in the fashion and beauty industry. I think one of those is uh, investing in e-commerce. I think, like I said, if a brand didn't have a great e-commerce experience before this. They probably spent the first month of this crisis um, getting that up to speed so that they weren't losing any of that precious revenue. Um, I expect e-commerce to get even more um, robust, more span more touch points, be more interactive, um, and be more bespoke and one-to-one. -one. I think we'll also see brands start to reevaluate the role of wholesale do they need wholesale? The answer is most likely yes, but what does wholesale look like? Is it those pop-in experiences? Is it just exclusives with one wholesaler as opposed to looking at all of them for distribution? I think we'll see brands reevaluate the role of wholesale in their entire um, sales channel strategy. Um, I think as we, as e-commerce becomes bigger and as direct grows as a bigger share of um, a brand's sales, I think brands will start to be able to better tailor one-to-one -one experiences using that unique view of the customer and using that data across channels to provide those one-to-one -one experiences. Um, brands, I think, also would be wise to emphasize that idea of fewer, better, slower. I think what we're seeing um, in this crisis is that, like in Everlane, for example, you have to, you can't just talk about it, you have to be about it. And when you preach radical transparency um, and then lay off 300 of your retail workers and your back end workers that we're trying to unionize, that's not really radically transparent. And I think they're getting a lot of backlash for that. So I think this idea of fewer, better, slower needs to be embedded, not just in communications, but also in supply chains, materials, um, the way a brand operates on the whole. Um, and then I think we've seen a ton of experimentation with live video, whether that's within social commerce, whether that's within a dot com experience, um, whether that's replacing a fashion show, for example. Um, I do think that live video will be a behavior, a media behavior that consumers are picking up on even more so now, but that will extend, I think, after the crisis as we see things like virtual concerts, for example, and their ability to be shoppable. Um, I think that'll provide a brand new shopping channel, whether that's TikTok like Levi's, whether that's on Instagram, whether that's within gaming and esports. I think live video is a rich touch point for the category. Um, 
and one that I think is great to experiment with uh, now. So thank you all so much for all your questions. Um, are there any questions, Adam, before we wrap? Yep, one more. Um, okay. Do you think that a similar slowdown will happen within skincare from a consumer perspective, i.e. people becoming much more mindful of what they're buying? So it's really interesting. Skincare is up, I think, five to ten percent. People, color cosmetics are down. Skincare and hair care are up, as are things like home fragrance, for example. Um, I think consumers are getting more choosy about their skincare right now. I think if you were previously really busy and maybe used a moisturizer, and now you have time for um a toner and then an eye cream and then a serum and then a moisturizer, and you're seeing your skin um improve as the result of that i think that behavior could be embedded going forward um i think what we've seen in skincare up until now is i would almost say like a, a layering on effect i think that's the result of behaviors we see in japan behaviors we see in korea more kind of niche products that have one specific function that are layered together to create an entire skincare routine um, I do think the idea of ethically sourced ingredients um, that are highly efficacious, that are in environmentally sound packaging, I do expect that to be a trend um, following this. But I do think on the whole, I would expect to see prolonged um, growth of the skincare category after this because of people's experimentation and increased buying of skincare um, now. All right. Well, that was very well timed. Thank you all so much. If there are any one other more questions. Question. Oh, one okay. more question just came in. Do you expect complexion cosmetics to increase as well? For example, foundation, concealer, and blush. I would. So I think nobody is buying that right now because we don't have anywhere to go. Um, and Zoom filters are really great. Um, I expect to see, and I've seen data that also says that there is an expectation to rebound in color cosmetics. I think after 2008, there was um, there was a in beauty the trend after 2008 was towards minimalism, great fresh skin, really clean palettes, dewy, healthy. It wasn't. I, th I think we might in color cosmetics see less of this contour trend that we've been seeing and these ostentatious um, eye colors that we've been seeing and more of a return towards almost like a, if you think about like a Phoebe Philo aesthetic where it's a lot of nudes, really dewy, photo ready skin, maybe nude on the eye, I would expect that to return. I don't think we'll see brash color or heavy makeup until um, a couple years from now. All right. Thank you all so much. Um, I, If there are any other questions, my email is up on the screen, christina at ipglab.com. Feel free to email me any questions. Otherwise, stay safe, and I look forward to